don't know why I came. Huh? I don't know why I came. I don't know why. I don't know why I came. Damn. I don't know why I came. So today I'm here with Quinn McDuffie. How are you doing today? I'm doing great, man. I'm doing great. I can't get the plane. And where are you originally from? I'm originally from San Diego, but, you know, I, I, my family is a military-based family, so you could really say that I'm from everywhere. I, I live in Chicago, um, Montgomery, Alabama, uh, Virginia, California, and a host of other places, so um, I'm just really <laughs> a traveler. Uh, so by being a technically a military child, how how do you think that kind of helped you mold you in terms of playing basketball since you traveled from different places? And I know different places have certain styles of basketball. How did that help a little? Oh man, that was big, man. Um, that actually that's a great question because that really shaped uh, you know my mentality towards this uh, overseas basketball thing because. Growing up, when you move in every two to three years, um, during that time, you don't really understand what you're getting prepared for. <clears throat> and when I embarked on this journey uh, playing basketball, um, you know, where it's so uncertain and every year you change in locations, change in countries, and change in teams. And, you know, that's a direct reflection of what my childhood was like. So, um, unlike other Americans, I'm able to adjust uh, faster than maybe a regular person who didn't grow up like that would. So, where did you ultimately um, go for high school? I know you said you was military, so I'm pretty sure you had to switch high schools a lot. So, Oh, yeah. So, um, I went to two different high schools. I started high school in San Diego, California at Otay Ranch High School, which is in Chula Vista. Um, I played there for two years on varsity, and I went to um, a school in Suffolk, Virginia, called Nansman River High School uh, for my junior and senior year, and I finished out my high school basketball in Suffolk, Virginia. Um, high school basketball for me was great. It started off kind of slow, um, just me, growing and trying to get used to my body and things like that. And as a junior, once I moved to uh, Virginia, things just kind of took off for me um, as far as recruiting wise and as far as experience and, uh, you know, prepping for college. Okay. So when did you start ultimately getting recruited by um, schools? Well, um, I started to get recruited my sophomore year in high school because my role on the team in California got much bigger. And um, coaches start seeing what I could do, and um, they start sending letters to the house and things like that. And um, I really didn't get any serious interest until I moved to Virginia because the level of basketball was higher. It was more serious and more important, so to speak. So... And that's when I really developed and matured as a basketball player once I moved to uh, Virginia and started playing there. Um, I, I want to say my, one of my first letters uh, from a, a Division One school was Longwood and Central Connecticut State University. So you, you was getting some D1 offers, but it wasn't like, University of Virginia and West Virginia, but you were getting uh, some D one yeah. offers. I, I was getting, I was getting D one interest in the ninth and tenth grade, but by junior and senior year, I was getting D one offers, okay. um, but not any high major level schools. It was mostly D uh, twos, um, low major and mid major D- Division one schools who were looking to offer me and looking to bring me into their school. Okay. So where did you ultimately decide on going to, and what was your reason for going to that particular school? Well, man, um, ultimately, I played my first year of uh, college basketball at a school called Virginia Wesleyan College. 
Collins is in Norfolk, Virginia. Um, I decided to go there because, um, man, with my dynamics of me moving from uh, the, the West Coast to the, to the East Coast, it kind of studied my growth on the circuit. So um, a lot of my options were, you know, limited. And um, I had a couple prep schools that I could have went to, but I just chose to go the four-year route, and I went to Virginia Wesleyan. There I had a couple, uh, you know, bumps in the road and things like that. I finished out the season, and I transferred to Alabama State University where I was forced to redshirt, and um, I gained a lot of experience, gained a lot of knowledge about the game, <clears throat> and I ended up transferring again to Chawan University which is in North Carolina, it's a Division II school, and I played three years there. And that's where I ultimately graduated and, and finished uh, my college basketball career. Uh, what division was Virginia Wesleyan? Was it a D2? It was actually a Division three school, man. It was actually a Division three school. So you um, I played there first at the Division three. And then I went to Alabama State University, which is a Division One, And then I went to Chawan University, which is a Division Two school. So <laughs> it's sort of like my childhood, moving around mm. and things like that. Man. Did you actually see, like, oh, now I know, now I know the difference between a, a D3 and a D1 and a D2 oh, and yeah. a D1? Did you? Oh, yeah, most definitely, man. I, I could see it. Um, just in the styles of play, and, um, the size and the speed of the game was a lot different um, on each level. And you could tell the difference. It's a significant difference between each level. And um, I was just fortunate enough to uh, experience all three levels uh, and whatnot. So it worked out, man. It was a great experience. I wouldn't change it. Um, but what I would tell people who – uh, are in college to you know pick a school that you want to go to and don't do it because of a sport. Pick it because they want you there. They're giving you the most money, or you just like it there. Yeah. I feel you. So you ended up graduating from um, Chowan University. What? When did you decide like that? basketball was your mindset. Like, I wanted to go overseas and play. Did you ever think about just getting a regular job? Or was professional always on your mind? You know, what's so funny is before I moved to uh, Virginia, I had never thought about even going to college. I was just playing high school basketball just to play. And when I got my first letter when I was in California, it opened my eyes to like, man, this is, it could be something bigger than just high school basketball. And I finally moved to Virginia my junior year, and I had a, an assistant coach who played at Norfolk State University and went on to play professional for 15 years overseas. And um, he would always tell us about playing in Europe and playing overseas, and it just stuck with me. It fell into my subconscious, and I knew from my junior year on that's what I wanted to do is play basketball on a professional level. Not so much in the NBA, but just overseas with the traveling experiences and just the little perks like that. I always knew from hearing his stories and being exposed to the things he was exposed to, it, it that just stuck with me. That's what I knew I wanted to do from then on. Okay, so once you had a mindset like I wanted to go overseas and play basketball, which is not a lot of guys in basketball, especially in the United States, mind to automatically think I want to go overseas. Usually they think about big money and playing in the NBA. So when you had that mindset, where did you start from? Like, did you start from the like a semi-pro league? Or did you just get an agent instantly? Well, I finished college in 2013 and fall 2013 I signed my first deal in Russia I got an agent in March right after my season my college season was over I got an agent hired an agent we worked together from March up in, 
until I got my first deal in Russia. After I got my first deal in Russia, I was away from the team within a month or so um, due to, you know, money situation and things like that. So less than two weeks later, I signed with another agent and uh, he got me a deal in Mongolia in the top division in Asia. And uh, that's how I uh, started my professional career. Just really getting with an agent and working closely with him up until that time where I signed. <clears throat> it was definitely not easy, though. Um, a lot of networking, a lot of, you know, studying film and tape, um, a lot of no's. You get a lot of no's before you get any yeses. And um, that's the thing that a lot of guys can't handle, the word no. So um, they give up, they quit. You know, but you got to stay with it and you got to believe in the people that you hire and you got to believe in yourself as well. How do you get the trust of your agent, especially how you jumped from a D3 to D1 to a D2? How do you think, how were you able to get the trust of the agent to say, okay, I see something in you for me to market overseas? Man, you know what is so funny about Things like this, man, you don't, you can't trust nobody. Like you don't, you never put your whole trust in in, uh, in in people. You trust the process, and you trust yourself. You know. So my thing was, I'm never gonna, I'm gonna use this guy for what he brings to the table. We're not friends. We're not buddies. Uh, you know, he works for me. And that's one thing you got to understand. You hire an agent. They they work for you. You don't work for them. So while they're working for you, you have to work for yourself as well. So you never put your whole career in someone's hands on any level of basketball. You know what I mean? A lot of guys like to say, uh, well, I'm not focused on getting my film right now. Coach got it. Coach got it. And once the season is over and coach really doesn't got it, you know, Coach really didn't get your film, and he really wasn't talking to European coaches about you, and, and then you're stuck. And, you know, that's how a lot of guys don't uh, jump, make that jump to the pros because they leave their career in an agent's hand, in a coach's hand, and someone else's hands, and they don't do the work for themselves. You know, so um, I hired an agent. I let him work for me. And I work for myself as well, networking, talking to people I knew who played overseas, asking for help, asking questions, researching. And those are the things that, um, and, and of course, prayer. And those are the things that landed me uh, my first job overseas. So you said your first official contract was going over to Mongolia. How was that first time leaving the United States? I know you. You travel from college and you travel during high school, but it's a totally different thing when you're actually going overseas and you're by yourself. How was that first experience? It's scary, man. Um, it was very scary. Um, the only places I've ever been out of the country was being in California. Everyone goes to Mexico, so that's really almost like America. And I've been to uh, uh, Dominican Republic, but... Going overseas, man, it's a feeling you can't even describe. You're happy, um, <clears throat> you're sad, you're excited, you're nervous, all at once. So it's kind of hard to describe. But um, the whole flight, my chest was pounding. I didn't know what to expect. I was just anxious to get there, anxious to play. Um, just a lot of different emotions running high all at once. And... Um you played in Mongolia. How was the competition there? Is it high? Is it high competition in Mongolia? Believe it or not, Mongolia is in Central Asia. Um, the Asians there in Mongolia, they they weren't as good as Americans, obviously. But that league brings in high-level Americans and high-level imports, which makes the league 
a lot better. So they bring in D League guys, they bring in former NBA players, they bring in high level uh, university guys. So, um, uh, Smush Parker, if you're familiar with that guy, yeah, I was um, just gonna uh, say that. Played for the Lakers, he played in Mongolia last season. Andre Brown, who played for the New Orleans Hornets, um, he was in Mongolia last season. Um, it's a lot of guys, man. Um, former NBA players and D-League guys who who played in Mongolia. So the domestic players don't make the league competitive. It's the imports that's brought to the league that make it competitive. How was the living arrangement staying there? Man, um, we talking negative 40 degree uh, conditions <laughs> and it's uh, snow eight, nine months out of the year in Mongolia. So that's one of the coldest places uh, on the planet is Mongolia. And um, it, it was tough, man. It was definitely tough. Um, it, it's an experience that I'll never forget. I did it with some guys that I still uh, talk to these today. And um, it was just a different experience, man, from the weather to the food to the people. And um, just to the lifestyle and the culture. Um, you don't necessarily have to um, say how much you were getting your salary for this particular team, but was it decent enough? Oh, yeah, man. Um, the thing about going overseas, it's all about your situation. So you think about it, a kid, 22 years old, Going overseas for the first time, I'm not married, no kids, no house back at home. Uh, you know, the only bill that's in my name is maybe my insurance and my cell phone bill. So going overseas and making around 3000 to $6,000 a month for seven months that you can make a living and, and, and live comfortable, you know, uh, with that being a 22, 23-year-old. You know what I mean? Yeah. So it, um, it's, it's all about the dynamics of your situation going into um, a contract like that. You know, if, for somebody who has two kids back at home and a wife and supporting the household, maybe $6,000 a month isn't good for them. Maybe they need more. You know, yeah. but in my situation, the money that I was getting was comfortable for me. And I could work with it. Three thousand or six thousand a month would definitely be good for me, and and I'm still in college, so I ask, I understand <laughs> yeah. you on that one. So it all depends on your situation back at home. So after that, when do you start looking for your next job? During the middle of that season, or just by the end of the season, you start okay? Let's do the process again. That's a very good question, man. And I, I really don't like to let people in on my uh, your secret, my process or my secret. <laughs> right, but cool. I'm, I'm gonna tell. I'm gonna tell you. But um, you know, a lot of guys mess up. They get a job and they forget how they got their job by grinding and networking. I never stop. I'm still networking now. Um, I never stop networking throughout the year. Talking to coaches, GMs, uh, liaisons, talking to agents. I never stop. I'm always doing it. Um, I'll never stop. I do it for other people now as well. So it's just a habit for me. I always try to stay ahead of the curve, ahead of the curve, and try not to get lost in the sauce. <laughs> because if you wait till May like everybody else do, then you'll be in the mix with everybody else. But if you're doing it year round, People know your name. Oh, I heard of this guy, man. Oh, I talked to this guy. Oh, okay, okay, we'll bring him in. And they looking to sign you by June. You know, vice is waiting until May, and you might not even get signed, or you might sign in October. You know, so I never stop networking and looking for my next opportunity. Never. I understand. Do you feel like it's a lot of pressure on a lot of these? teams 
like the general manager and the coaches to bring in imports when they're possibly getting maybe 300 to 500 guys from the United States daily trying to get a job. And it's hard to weed out who's actually serious about playing professional basketball and who just really wants to say they played overseas. Do you think it's hard for them to weed out those guys? Well, now with the internet and um, everything being so uh, uh, accessible to, to these GMs, it's not really that hard anymore. You know, it's a long process, but, you know, once you um, look everybody up, you can see who's serious and who's worth the money and who's, you know, just by their resume. You line up each person, each candidate's resume up, and you can tell the ones who's serious and the ones who can play and the ones who can't play. You know, so everything's uh, uh, on the internet, pretty much. Now, back in the 90s, it will be harder. You know, you, you it's hard to look up somebody's stats. It's hard to look up somebody's social media because they use that as well. <clears throat> if they like you, they like your stats and your stuff you do on the court, they'll say, all right, they'll get an anonymous, anonymous profile and they'll start following you on Instagram or Facebook just to see what you do throughout the day, just to see if you're working out, to see if you smoke, or to see if just what you're talking about, what kind of person you are. They do they do that sometimes. So it's, it's not really that hard to see who's serious and who's not. The guys who's serious have jobs and they're making money. The guys who are not serious, some of them get by sometimes, but um, you never know if they're making money or not. You know, that, that's the goal to make money, not just to play overseas. So once you finished in Mongolia, um, what was your next job destination? My next job was in Spain. I played in uh, Spain, um, in northern Spain, for La Gallofa Camp Baskets. <clears throat> that was another great experience for me as well, being that it was my first time actually playing in Europe. And it opened my eyes to the style of play and, uh, you know, the politics of basketball as well. What do you mean by the politics of basketball? Was it something different in Spain? It was way different, man. Um, just that style of play is so uh, team-oriented and slow. And um, it's not a fan-friendly game in Europe on that level. And um, another thing about the politics is in Europe, they have egos bigger than America in some cases, and they feel as though their basketball is better than America, and rightfully so. And when they bring an import in, they feel like they don't want the import to outshine the team, so we they try to find ways to hold or contain um, the athlete or the import. They try to contain it by, you know, playing you spot minutes, um, uh, drawing up plays so that uh, you can kind of be out of the offense. You know, just things like that. Little little things that can affect the player. They try to to, to manipulate the game, you know? Mm -hmm. and, and, and that's their style of play. I, you know, I'm, I'm not mad about it, but that's just how it is and, and, and I had to experience that to really understand and, and grasp the situation so it was just little mind games basically yeah yeah just a little intricate things that you know it, it seems pointless or meaningless but it has a huge effect on a player's psyche during the course of a game like if I make two shots in a row you're pulling me out and sit me down until the end of the third or the end of the fourth, and now I'm out of rhythm. You know, just little things like that. Yeah. So, so many defense, offense. <clears throat> so relatively speaking, it sounded like you didn't have a comfortable experience in Spain, I guess with the team that you were uh, playing with. No situation is really comfortable. It's, it was an it was a learning experience. I would say 
I, I'm definitely not mad about it because at the end of the day, I'm a professional and I, I just learned to adjust. But it was definitely a different experience um, <clears throat> going to uh, playing in Europe for a whole season for the first time. It was definitely a different experience. Okay. And now you're playing in Argentina, right? Yes. Um, how is how has that been? Because I that's a totally different thing from going to Central Asia to Europe, and now you're down in Argentina. How has that been? Yeah, man, three continents in three years. <laughs> um, like like I said, the first time it's another different experience, and I gotta adjust. And um, it's been great so far, man. I've been here since August fifth. It's just been a great experience. I like the team. I like the uh, the atmosphere, the weather, and um, a lot of people don't know, but Argentina is like huge on basketball. Mm-hmm. You know, this is their uh, biggest sport almost. They they love basketball. The fans are so into it. It's so intense. And um, we just had our first match last Friday. Um, we're one and zero, and just trying to continue this streak and. Just keep continuing to get better each day, but so far I love it. And I, I was a little I didn't know that uh, South America had like their own version of the Euro League down there. They had like Liga Suda America, I believe. Mm-hmm. Is, yep. your, is yep. your team in it? Oh no no no, my team is in it. But um, I, I know exactly what it is. Uh, the Liga Suda Americas. Mm-hmm. Which is um, it's combined of all the um, countries, like you just said, all the top. I think one or two teams in each country in, in each country in South America. They all combine and they play in um, a league. And um, you know those that that's the, actually that's actually a great league to get exposure in. Um, a lot of Americans play in it. Um, it's very high level talent, and like you said, it parallels the Euro League and the Euro Cup. So it's a very good league, but my team is in, in it. Um, not this year, no. Um, I've been looking at some of your pictures that you've been posting with the team, and just the environment. It seems like it's a great environment. It's uh, in the gym, the people. Seem like you're kind of enjoying it down there, honestly. I love it, man. Um, like I said, it's a great basketball atmosphere. Everything here is basketball, basketball, basketball. And um, I, I really was caught off guard by that because, you know, growing up, I didn't know Argentinians loved basketball. I would think, you know, soccer would be their, you know, sport of choice, which they do play soccer, but just basketball is so big, man. It, it, they care so much. The fans are so passionate. And our, for our first home game, the man, the environment was just electric, man. It was something I had never seen. Um, Reds make a bad call. You got fans throwing things on the court. Um, you know, just rowdy, man. And that's the atmosphere that I love to play in each night. So it, it works out perfect. Does it take you back to maybe your college or your high school days with the fan environment like definitely, that? Definitely. Most definitely. Take me back to my uh, high school days, man. Most definitely, man. Is the, Ar- definitely is the Argentinian play style kind of, is it fast-paced compared to playing in Mongolia and Spain? Is it faster? Mm, uh, yeah, they, 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 they utilize their bigs. Uh, uh, very well, and they like to get get out and run. Um, in Europe, they don't run as much. They like to play team oriented, slow, slow down. But in Latin America, so far, you know, they like to run, man, and get get out on a break and dunk, and uh, you know, rest. Let it let the game get physical, and they don't call as many calls and violations as they do in Europe. So it's definitely an open system in an open style of play, um, what I've experienced so far being here. Okay, winding down on the interview now. What would you say would be your best 
um, position to be in in terms of playing basketball in the next three to five years, playing in the D League, Euro League, or what was what would you say would be your best position? Um, well, my ideal situation would be playing in maybe uh, the CBA, which is the China Basketball Association, or uh, Qatar. Those are my two um, ideal situations for myself financially and, uh, you know, physically on the court. Those are two places that I would love to play and love to finish out my career. Um, and also, even Argentina, man. Argentina is a great place. The weather is nice. Uh, uh, I like the basketball. I like the style I play. Uh, I like the perks you get here. So Argentina is, uh, this wouldn't be a, a bad place either. What What would you say some of your weaknesses and some of your strengths are? On the court? Some of my weaknesses on the court would probably be, uh, would probably be shooting the three, the three ball. Uh, I've gotten a lot better at shooting the three ball um, in transition and, um, coming off screens, but that's probably one of my weakest um, elements to my game. And if I want to take um, my game to the next level and play on a higher stage, that's really one area I need to work on. Um, my three-point shot and my ball handling skills. And some of my strengths would, um, would be my physicality, um, on the offensive end and defensive end, and uh, rebounding on the offensive and, de and, and defensive end. Um, and uh, also my IQ. I have a high IQ for basketball, um, and I, I can just see the floor from all positions. So those are some of my weaknesses and strengths. Okay. So after playing basketball, once you accumulate almost all the money that you can, what do you see yourself doing after basketball is finished? Well, I have a degree in uh, criminal justice, and I'm working on my master's right now in um, cybersecurity. And that's really what I can see myself doing, something within the law enforcement um, realm while either coaching an AAU team or um, coaching a high school basketball team. <clears throat> and I'm also, I really don't want to put it out there like that, but I'm also working on a management company <clears throat> and an agency. So I can just help guys that's coming from uh, circumstances uh, similar to mine reach their goals and get overseas and do the things they want to do and make some money for them and their family. So, those are some things that I see myself venturing into uh, once my playing days are over. So I can still, you know, kind of be connected to the game, in a sense, and be in my career field. So, final question. Uh, I've been seeing some of your posts on Instagram, I mean, not on Instagram, but on Facebook. And I guess all of America know about the Lamar Odom situation what would you say to uh master p he had like a he went on a little rant on about kobe bryant i don't know if you heard about that so, so what would you say about that because he a lot of people say he was out of line for saying that for what he said to kobe about kobe saying he's being phony what would you say about that situation i feel about this situation what Master P said, I think that, because I respect Master P. This is a guy who came from zero dollars to $400 million. So he has a high IQ, number one, and his perspective is really, really valued in, in my opinion. But I feel he does know Lamar Odom on a personal level, so I feel as though he had insight, a little bit more insight that people not giving him credit about. 
on the situation. So I feel like he's speaking for Lamar <clears throat> in, in some ways. So Lamar probably came to him and told him, hey, man, Kobe got power with the Lakers, but he's not exercising the power to get me back on the court or get me back signed with the Lakers. You know, I think he, I think Master P heard that from Lamar and he was expressing it. Um, but at the same time, if he did not hear that from, directly from Lamar, then I don't feel as though he was in the right to say that about Kobe. You know, if he did not receive first word information from Lamar, I feel as though he's not credible to speak on a situation like that because no man's life should be in another man's hands. You know? Um, Master P, like I said, Master P is a very smart guy, so I don't think he would just say that without having... Lamar's word behind that, you know. Mm-hmm. But um, I, I don't believe uh, Kobe is at fault for for anything that Lamar's done. I, I don't believe that. Um, just personally speaking, but um, I do believe if Kobe did have the power to get Lamar signed with the Lakers and um, and he did exercise that power. I feel like Lamar would not be in this situation that he was in, you know, because he did spiral out of control um, after the decision with the Lakers and his time with the Lakers was up. So, in my opinion, I feel as though Kobe probably should have exercised that power if he had the power to do that. So, it was great talking to you. Quinn? Thanks, man. It's a pleasure, man. It was a pleasure. And I wish you great luck in Argentina, and hopefully y'all can win some championships down there, or a championship. Oh, yeah. Most definitely, man. I appreciate you. And, um, you know, it's, it's, it's always a pleasure speaking with you, man. No problem. So I should have this video up. Huh? What'd you say your name was? Hannah! Yeah. Hannah Montana, 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 Hannah Montana.